A reading from Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He, got, he dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I'll break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste it shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Word of God, word of life. Look down from heaven, O God, behold and tend this mind. Look down from heaven, O Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow, and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. Look down from heaven, O oh God, behold and tend this vine. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall so that all who pass by pluck off its grace? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold and attend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. Look down from heaven, O Who would like to join me for a children's moment up here? Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, you can stay standing. Perfect. Come on up. Hey, what kind of fruit grows in a vineyard? Does anyone know? They're small, they're round. Like tomatoes? Mm, oh, no. Although I do love me some tomatoes. No, these are sweeter than tomatoes. Sometimes they're purple, sometimes they're green. They are grapes. grapes. Yes, grapes grow in vineyards. Uh huh, uh huh. It's like the color up there. Now, 
in biblical times, when people had vineyards and they'd grow grapes, you know what else they'd do? They'd have to step on the grapes. What? Yeah. <laughs> to make grape juice, right? Because then with the grape juice, they could make wine. So I need your help today. Everyone up. Everyone up. Get your feet out. We're going to stomp some grapes. What? Yeah. I mean, I don't have any grapes here to stomp, which is but probably a good my thing. Your high heels do not want to do it? Well, that's all right. Everyone else then, stomp some grapes. Come on, stomp some grapes. We're making wine, yeah. Yeah, stomp, 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 stomp the grapes. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, all right. Well stomped. Well stomped. Now we can, now we can make the wine. Which is part of what Jesus teaches us about what it means to be people of the vineyard that we're part of what the vineyard produces. Could be wine, could be fruit. Maybe we'll take some of those grapes home and eat them with our family. But maybe we can do that together this week. For the wine might taste footy. You're right. Could be a little weird, but maybe that's okay. So, this week, if any of you eat grapes, maybe at school or at home, Remember that. And remember what Jesus teaches us about the vineyard that we're about to hear. Cool? You rock. All right, head back to your families. You're good. Stomp those grapes. <laughs> Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus continued with the chief priests and elders, saying, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. Now when the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they said to Jesus, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded Jesus as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. You may be seated. Good morning, dear people. Have you ever moved from one place to another and then had to figure out all those 
little quirks of the new place you were living in? Yes, yes. One of the things I first remember wondering about when we moved to Rochester was what's the deal with all the geese? (laughs) Right? I mean, from the Canadian Honker restaurant downtown, 2nd Street, to all those giant decorated cement geese that are all over the place in the center of town, to even the geese flying in formation on the flag of our city, (laughs) geese are represented everywhere. Which, as we've gotten to know Rochester, makes a lot of sense because indeed geese are everywhere in Rochester, especially this time of year. And our neighborhood is no exception. We live just across 52 here, and there's this retention pond just south of the farmland. I don't know if it's part of the flood control project or what, but it's there. And in and around this pool, this time of year, the geese are continually gathering. Presumably, or at least I like to think, because the Silver Lake Goose Motel is filled to capacity, and this is like the next best western along the interstate, right? (laughs) But regardless, each fall around this time of year, we often wake up in the morning to that sound of a huge honking skein of geese coming in low over our house, getting their angle of approach just right for their final descent into the watering hole. And I've noticed more than once that even if it's just one goose coming in, they still honk and honk and honk with all their might. And I've been wondering if such lonesome honking is perhaps in some ways a cry of lament as they search for the rest of their companions, hoping to soon be joined together again in their communal movement towards more sustainable southern life. Which is perhaps something we might learn from today. For I don't think we're always that good at expressing lament, calling out for togetherness in difficult times. Certainly today we've tried to make room to do just that, to embody in a compelling way the lectionary texts that are appointed for this week, the broken love song of Isaiah lamenting the vineyard, God's people who did not bring forth the life that was hoped for in their world, and the cry of the psalmist who laments all that has devastated the nation. And even Jesus in the gospel text today cuts to the center of the difficult life that his community is facing, using Isaiah and the psalmist's vineyard analogies to illustrate how the absentee landowner priests and elders have set up this generational system that only benefits them, and in doing so have created such violence in the lives of the tenants that the tenants in turn are responding violently to overthrow the unjust system so that they might actually have a chance of living abundantly. On the one hand, having a trio of texts such as these proves to be dispiriting, especially in another week of news cycles such as the one we are in. But on the other hand, I'm thankful for Matthew's proclamation that Jesus is indeed the cornerstone of justice who stands opposed to anything that hinders abundant life. For indeed, we need such a reminder in the midst of our lament. As my colleague, Pastor Tim Brown, reflected earlier this week, he said, we as Christians are often called to do the thing that most humans hate doing. We walk with tragedy in the one hand and hope in the other. And we hold the tension between the two, never letting the tragedy overcome the hope. 
Hope is not a starry-eyed optimism. It's not the practice of pontificating trite moralisms. Hope is living in the unwavering conviction that as Apostle Paul says, whether we live or whether we die, we are with God. From Romans chapter 14. Indeed, God holds us and moves us bit by bit towards a healing wholeness that makes all things new. Which reminds me of the song that Desmond Tutu has taught us to sing. Do you know this one? Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours, victory is ours, through God who loves us. Victory is ours, victory is ours, through God who loves us. Which is perhaps just the kind of proclamation we need as we work towards tending the vineyard of our world so that the sweet wine of life might flow even more abundantly. So, dear people, go out in good courage, knowing that God's hand guides you and Christ's love supports you, even in our deepest lament. Amen. Amen.